Today with Joseph Prince. Thank God for the communion. Thank God for the work of Jesus. We can believe God for healing. Amen? I want to say something to you. God is not a God that jumps on the gun straight away. Oh, you say and I'm going to blast you. No. God waited. God waited. God is not slack concerning His promise. As some count slackness, His long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. Not willing! He's not willing! He's not willing. Are, are there those who perish? Yes. But God, on, in God's heart, He's not willing. Then why don't He save them, Pastor Prince? Free choice. Man was not a robot, was not created a robot. God gave man a choice. You can get up right now and walk away. God won't stop you. Jesus said, how I wish Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to gather you as a mother hen would gather her chicks. But notice the four words, but you would not. Would. It's a choice. And now you're left to yourself and armies will come around you. And that happened. We know it happened. So God is not slack, okay? But He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why is God delaying? He's waiting for more to be saved. Amen. Good God. Don't despise His slackness. Don't despise His slackness. And I see a story in the Bible of a terrorist. And what did God do? God knocked him off his high horse, literally, and saved him and made him the greatest apostle of grace that the world has ever seen. The Apostle Paul. I thank God for that. God doesn't deal the way men, you know. What a heart. So Enoch, realize God told Enoch, judgment is coming. You'll find Enoch's prophecy in the New Testament in the book of Jude. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, saying, to so judge the ungodliness of the ungodly, of the ungodly speeches they have spoken against him. All right? And Enoch saw it. And God says, Enoch, judgment is coming. Enoch says, God, I'm ready. The flood is coming to the earth. I am ready. And God says, you will have a son. Say, yes. Thank you, Lord. But God says, I want you to name him. Mutusala. Indian name. Mutu, Mutusala. Okay. You, it's Mutusala. Okay. But actually in Hebrew, Mut. Mut is death. So, Methuselah. You call his name Methuselah. Say, Lord, what, what do you mean? His death, when he dies, he will bring, like an arrow. His death will bring. What does it mean? What does it mean, Lord? Then as the boy grew up, he noticed that God kept the boy strong and healthy. And the boy lived and lived and lived. And Enoch, the Bible says, Enoch had a revelation, by the way. When he was born, he had a revelation already. Because the Bible says, after Methuselah was born, Enoch walked with God. So this revelation of the end times will cause people to walk with God. And his name means what? When he dies, he will come. That means the moment this boy dies, the judgment, the flood will come. And they watch. And the news was spread far and wide. Watch this boy. Every time he has a sneeze and all that, all the neighbors come running with their handkerchief and their chicken soup, and every family had their own chicken soup. Every time, you know, the boy, they would help the boy up. I mean, they, they, they don't want to see him die. And he became the longest living man to record on earth. He lived longer than Adam. Methuselah lived 969 years. Why? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God, people. That's the heart of God. God says, yeah, it's going to happen. Yes, yes, the iniquity is full. It's going to happen. Your boy will be called. When he dies, he will come. Then God waited. <laughs> what a heart. That's why it's called long suffering. I like the old English, long suffering. Every marriage must have this long suffering. Some of you suffer for a while, you whack. You let fly some words. Long suffering. The first characteristic of love. Love is, the modern says patience, but the word long suffering. I love it. I love it. Amen. Introducing Grace Academy. 
If you've ever had questions about how to walk in grace or what it means to live by grace, this is the place where you'll find answers on how to live a life that's anchored on our Lord Jesus. Grace Academy is a digital pastoring experience designed to help you navigate some of life's hardest questions. Get free access today. Text GA to 71239 or visit josephprince.org slash GA. So we see a rapture and we see another group that goes through the flood. Deliver, it, but in the flood. Deliver it nonetheless, but deliver it out of the flood. He came out to a new world, Noah. So there are people already in heaven, like Enoch, never died, like the rapture, we will be raptured. But then there are people who will be saved later and they'll go through the great tribulation. And they'll be delivered when Jesus comes. And that's what it means. He that endures to the end is referring to those three and a half years. Jesus talking in the context of the end when he mentioned Matthew 24, he that endures to the end shall be saved. He's not referring to you last long enough, you'll be saved. No, we are all saved. The word safe is also delivered. He that endures to the end shall be delivered because he's returning. So when it comes, it's not like the rapture. The rapture with twinkling of an eye, we will all go up. If you're born again, every born again person goes up. No matter how faithful, at what level of faithfulness, just like you're, you got saved, not by your faithfulness, but by his grace, you're also raptured by his grace because rapture is receiving your brand new body that will never grow old, never decay, never die, never feel pain, never feel bored, never fall asleep when the pastor is preaching, amen. It's a glorified body, an incorruptible body, and the Bible says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So every, everyone is born again is going up. Don't, don't, don't buy this partial uh, rapture theory, amen. Uh, the picture of Enoch, we are the first those who are saved before the judgment. But those who are saved in the judgment, they will go through the judgment, protected. Some will die as martyrs, but many of them will be protected. Amen. In the book of Revelation, 144,000 sealed with protection. Amen. And they will persevere to the end and the Lord will come and deliver them. Are you listening, people? Now we're about to see a story of same thing. Same thing. God is hiding all these future events in this, the Bible. We have a man looking at the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah from a higher elevation. Just like the church in the book of Revelation, they are crowned already in the earlier chapters. They're already in heaven, but they are looking down at all the judgments falling on the earth. The church is at home with God, worshiping, singing, and God is at home with the church because of the death of His Son. So it's a homely feel. God is sharing the secrets of His heart. In fact, when God told Abraham about Sodom and Gomorrah, it starts like this. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I'm about to say? Seeing that Abraham will be a great nation, for I have known him that he will order his family. I covered all that last week. But notice that God treats Abraham more than a disciple. He treats him like a friend. And you know how Jesus treats us? John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants. This is the upper room, the night before he died. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you, I have called you, I have called you friends. I have called you friends. Imagine, friend. Same thing like Abraham. Abraham is called a friend of God. And he said, shall I hide from Abraham? And uh, what is a friend to Jesus? A friend is someone you can share everything. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. He treats you, treats you like a friend. He will tell you things before it happens. Amen. So, Abraham knew it was going to happen long before the people of Sodom knew, even before Lot knew. Abraham saw the judgment, but from an, a place of elevation. He's not involved in the judgment. He has nothing in the judgment. Nothing burns his stuff up. He's breathing fresh air in the mountain, looking down. That's what's going to happen to us. You understand? Apostle Prince, uh, the Bible talks about, about those uh, uh, one shall be taken, one left and all that. I'll, I'll teach on that another day. Okay, because the one taken, one left is not the rapture. In fact, the church doesn't even appear in Jesus' account. It's referring to the Jewish believers. It's all Jewish account. Pray your flight be not on the Sabbath. It's all Jewish account. Flee to the mountains. I was what? Flee where? Mount Faber? <laughs> so it's all for the Jewish believers then. All right? Uh, Pastor Prince, that's why I don't read it. It's, it's not so important. Not so important? 
Do you know Matthew 24 is the it, they ask Jesus only three questions, all right? When the stones of the temple be overthrown, when will be the sign of your coming? Second one, what is the sign of the age? And Jesus gave them the longest response in all the Gospels. The longest, okay, friend. Not the longest sermon, death sermon on the mount, but the longest response. And you tell me it's not important? One day we'll teach on it. And some people will rap the rapture, they don't believe in the rapture, and they believe rapture and second coming all the same. Can you imagine Jesus come back, we are raptured halfway, then say, okay, turn around. <laughs> We're going back again. <laughs> My son will say, ha. Huh. <laughs> you know, no, it's two separate events. It's a secret revealed to Paul. Paul says, I show you a mystery. Rapture is a mystery. Second coming is not. All the patriarchs of the Old Testament, all the prophets, they prophesied of the second coming, not the rapture. It was hidden from them. Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery was hidden in the Old Testament. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That, no partial the uh, rapture theory. All believers will be changed. Are you listening, people? Then comes the millennium. Jesus comes, returns. Amen. And we have 1,000 years of perfect felicity, perfect happiness, perfect order of things on earth. No noise pollution. No pollution of any kind. This 1,000 year rule is not the final rule because we know the final thing because the final one is new heaven, new earth. Amen. But look at this. God wants to show man beyond the shadow of any doubt that man in and of himself, he cannot. Anything that depends on him, he cannot. So, the millennium is like this. Now, faith has become sight. They are seeing Jesus visibly. The nations of the earth, through their television, will see Jesus visibly. Amen. Everyone. So, what, what excuse do we have today when you try to talk to them about Jesus? No, I can't see what. I can't see, I can't believe. Well, the excuse will be no more. They will see him. They will see him do miracles still. They will see him, a boy, when he comes, a boy who is cr on crutches and all that, he will heal on television. Everyone will see it. The king ruling. No more corruption. No more robbery. So what, what excuse do you have? What excuse does this man have? I can't see, I can't see. Unless I see, I will not believe, like Thomas. Now you see. Okay, next one. There's a song that says, uh, Flip Wilson has a song that says, the devil made me do it. So even Christians and non-Christians, unbelievers will say, it's the devil, uh, the devil made me do it. You know, a lot of things are blamed on the devil today, right? I mean, he's responsible for a lot of things, I'll tell you this, for sure. Even the wars and, and uh, the, any bad thing on, on television is the devil. Okay, in the news, for sure. The Bible says the devil is causing things. The devil is trying to stop the seed from coming in the story of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. The promised seed. That's why the flood of Noah, which is my message, another message altogether, is trying to stop the seed from coming, which is the Messiah, the crusher of the devil's head, the serpent destroyer, the dragon slayer. He's trying to stop him from coming. But watch this, people. During the 1,000 year rule of Jesus, Satan is bound. Satan is bound. And it takes only one angel to bind him, by the way. He's bound for 1,000 years, the Bible says, so that he will not deceive the nations. So what's your excuse? You won't see Satan anymore. Because causing problems in this part of the world, causing tsunamis, and no more. Satan is gone. I mean, bound, not gone, bound. bound. Now the excuse is gone. Some people blame, you know, I cannot accept Jesus because my child is like this. How about that child down there? Even though not their own child, another child. How about that person down there? How about my grandfather? How about this? How about that? This person is sick. That person is deformed. This person is handicapped, mental as well. They blame God. Anything they blame God. They will never blame man's sin and the condition that came out of sin. I'm not saying that that family is suffering from something the father did. Sin comes from Adam. So that all the genes, our genes have fallen. I'm not referring to genes, bro. G E. I'm referring to G E E N.
I want to spell it your wig or not. I know it's G-E-N-E, -E, okay? But it's all fallen. So here and there, sometimes this person is healthy. Third and fourth down the line might not be healthy. But thank God for the communion. Thank God for the work of Jesus. We can believe God for healing, amen? But that excuse, I cannot accept a God who does things like that, will not be in existence. There'll be no more sickness. All doctors are out of job. No more hospitals. The great physician is ruling. And even his ministers, all of us will be here. We're the only ones with uncorrupt, incorruptible body because there'll be still people on earth, normal people. And everyone will rule. Some rule more cities, some rule less, depending on their faithfulness. That is faithfulness, all right? But we will all rule. So we are mixing together. Are you listening? So Satan bound. No more sickness. Then some say, you know, it's easy for you to say these kind of things. It's easy for America to say that. It's easy for you in Singapore to say that. It's easy for you to say that. You have a car, you have a house. But where we live, we hardly have clothes to wear. We don't know where our meal is coming from. If there's a God who loves us, you know, this is what we are going through. There'll be no more poverty. The whole earth will be wealthy. I mean, it's, it's back to Garden of Eden conditions. There is no lack. Amen. Sickness, no more. Do people still die? Yeah, but longevity. Uh, death will be an exception then. Longevity is the rule. In fact, Isaiah prophesied of that time, he says that if a man dies at 100 years old, he's a child. That's not normal during that time. <laughs> Are you excited? This is amazing. Amen? No more wars! He'll make wars, wars to cease to the ends of the earth. People complain today, well, if God is God, why are there so many wars tonight? All those complaints against God, God will have a rule where, what's your excuse now? And then the Bible says, the eternity is on a rule, we will be with Him. It's God's vindication of His nature, of His person, of His Son. And that's why His Son had to die. Amen? You see people, there are some grace teachers today that are teaching. They are teaching things that the other people, you know, some people are very smart. When they write an article, what they do is that they write articles on grace teachers. And you grace teachers, some of you, you give grace a bad name. You know, it's, they, they say that everybody is safe. Hallelujah. They seek sentimentalism. Everybody is safe. All right? No, 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 my friend. Everyone has to believe to be safe. The provision is for all, but you have to believe. Some write articles and they put these kind of names on, down there. Then they put uh, my name on the other side of the page so that they give an, an illusion that I believe these things. But you all know better. I think that's not noble. Yep. And that's not Christian to do. Yep. All right? So there are those who teach everybody is safe. Weird. Then there are those who are teaching uh, Praterist things, that everything is just spiritual in the book of Revelation. Uh, the end times is just uh, AD 70 and all that. And uh, when you ask them about 1,000 years, they say, oh, it's a spiritual expression. And they always go back to God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's the only thing they always go back to. But in the book of Revelation, times, three and a half years, times and times and a half and all that, it's literal time. 1,000 years there is literal so you ask them, if it's figurative that we are now, after Jesus died, figuratively, we are all in a thousand years. So why is there still sickness? And during a thousand years, Satan is bound. Yeah, he's bound. You, you call this world today uh, Satan bound? Well, if this is millennium, does it get any better? <laughs> so you must be careful of this kind of weird teachings. And, and the worst one of all is this. There is no more hell. Grace teaches no more hell. There's no hell, all right? Uh, fire just means God refined them and God refined them. Some of them, some of them even extreme to say even the devil will be saved. When I read my Bible, all right, God talks about hell as a place of torment. And if you argue from ion, or oh, ion can be used for a, 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 a period, all right, I'll tell you this. Don't argue based just on Scripture. I mean, Greek. I can argue based on Greek. Look at what the Word of God says. The things that are sin are temporal. 
The things that are not seen are ion compared with temporal. And the word ion, you say is temporal. How do you explain this? It's used for God, the eternal God, the temporal God. It's used for eternal redemption. Temporal redemption? Are you listening, people? You can even argue based on context. All right, so never mind. You all didn't come here to hear theology. You all come here to, to Satan-proof your family. Right? So let's finish the story. All right? Praise God. So go back to Abraham negotiating. And uh, the last part, I'm just to read to you. Okay, God says, shall I hide from Abraham? So he's going to share it like a, to a friend. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And I'll come down and see what's going to happen. Then the man turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Next. And Abraham came near. You see the boldness? Once God, God wants him to be bold. God wants him to intercede. Let me ask you a question. If God wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, why didn't God just go and destroy? Why did God go find a man that he knew would pray? So even though God is a God of justice, He's always wanting someone to pray, someone on earth, because God gave this earth to men. And in a sense, right now, in a sense, God doesn't have full reign on the earth. And then Jesus comes. Are you listening, people? So God wants men. Why did God visit Abraham? Why didn't he just go down to the plains of Jordan and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? God wanted to be interceded. Reminds me so much of Jonah. You know, Jonah got the most reluctant and the most successful evangelist. God told Jonah, go preach to the city of Nineveh, the, the headquarters of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian has been very wicked. You can go to the British Museum and see the, the pictures on the wall of the Assyrian Empire then and how they, they, they break the legs of the Jewish people. And you'll see the capture of Lachish, a Jewish city. And God said, go, preach to them. Tell them I'm going to judge Nineveh for their wickedness. And our friend didn't go. He went the other way. You know, long story, right? All right? He went down to Joppa. He left God, always go down. I always say that. When you leave God, you go down. He went down to Joppa. From Joppa, went down into the boat. From the boat, they throw him down into the sea. All right? And the sea became calm. And then he went down into the whale's mouth. And there's been more than one instance in history of a man still alive in the belly of the whale. I believe he's a whale. I know. Pastor, the Bible says big fish. Good for you. All right? My own personal opinion. All right? This is my pulpit. I give you my opinion. All right? It can be any fish. Let's not argue about that. That's not the point of a sermon. All right? Big fish. He got swallowed by a big fish. So, and the big fish gave him a, 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 a first class uh, <laughs> lodging all the way to Nineveh. And, and this is how he arrived at the, the terminal. All right? <laughs> Slide down. He slid out. Then he came out. John this the gastric, gastric juice of the whale. His hair is all gone. Eyebrows gone. There's no hair on his body. Amen. He looks jaundiced. You know, the gastric juice makes you look jaundiced. Then he comes down there. He's angry. Then he told the entire city. Yet in 40 days, God will overthrow the city. Then he walked off. All right. I counted in English, in King James, eight words. The shortest sermon that ever preached. In Hebrew, I look, at, I look up the Hebrew. In Hebrew, five words. 40 days, you die. <laughs> God will overthrow you. All right? And yet, the very next verse, the entire city repented. So I tell you, the most unwilling and the most reluctant uh, evangelist with the shortest sermon ever preached to the entire city got the greatest results that he did not want. <laughs> that he did not want. He didn't want them saved. So he was angry like a spoiled kid sitting on a mountain to see God, 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 God will not God will destroy. He looked, but God will destroy. Finally, he realized God's not going to destroy. 40 days came, God didn't destroy. And this is what he complained to God. He says to God this, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord! Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tashish. For I know 
that you are a gracious and merciful God. Slow to anger. Too slow for me. And abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. No, he didn't say, I, I, I always thought that he didn't want to preach because these people were wicked to his Jewish people. But actually, he didn't want to preach because he knew God's nature. Mm, 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 mm. He's got better theology than most Christians who believe that God is very quick to judge. I'm telling you, he says, I knew, I knew this. All right, go back, uh, go to verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to see revival uh, than to live. In essence, it's the most reluctant. <laughs> all right. Then the Lord said to him, is it right for you to be angry? And you all know the story, all right? Uh, God, God shattered him from, uh, from the heat of the day. Then the bitter God, I mean, the, I, I, it doesn't say bitter God, it just say God. I'm thinking of, and then the, the, the guard, the, the leaf, you know, withered up and the sun fell on him. He was so angry and God says, you care for a little plant. Should I not care for 120,000 people? They don't even know their right hand and their left. And that's the last verse of Jonah. He ends like that. The nature of our God. Slow to anger. Slow. Amen. What a word we've received today. Subscribe to the Joseph Prince Ministries YouTube channel for daily updates. And don't forget to share it with someone you know. You never know who might need to be encouraged today.